Good morning, everyone. Hey, it's good to see you guys here this morning. I'm excited. I love, I love when the body of Christ gathers together, and not just because I'm the pastor here. I'd come to this church even if I wasn't the pastor. I did. I came to the church when I wasn't a pastor. Because you guys are awesome, and Jesus is awesome, and he's, and he's really awesome in you. One of the things I love about the body of Christ is, you know, Jesus is really multifaceted. How many know that he's just amazing? You, could, you can and you will have the opportunity to spend eternity getting to know how amazing he is, and you'll never get bored, and you'll never find the end of the depth of who he is. And I'm, I'm personally just convinced that every human being, we're made in the image of God and we're, we're, you know, we were created to bear his image and I believe to reflect some of who he is. And, and I just personally have this, this belief that every human being in some way uniquely reflects who Jesus is. And uh, so if you really want to get to know who Jesus is, you're going to have to see him in others. Jesus actually said something like that that you'll, you'll get to know me by recognizing me in other people. So just turn to someone next to you and say, I just love Jesus in you. <laughs> All right. Hey, I want to do two things this morning. One, I just want to, I, I want to share a little bit of just as a family this morning, and uh, if we have guests or visitors, uh, welcome to the family. <laughs> you can just be part of the family this morning. I just want to talk to you a little bit about something that's just on my heart. It's been on the heart of the leadership team, something we've been praying about for this year. And then I want to share with you a story from the Bible that I hope uh, is your story or will be your story. Um, so one of the things that I always do every time we come into a new year, it's just a, it's an awesome opportunity just to begin to pray about the new year. Um, you know, we kind of arbitrarily, they kind of separate years. And, and uh, you know, to me, it is a good time when you enter into a new year just to sort of reflect on the past and think about the future. You know, Paul, Paul said, listen, I forget what lies behind, and I look forward, and I press on, and I could grab a hold of that which Christ grabbed a hold of me for. And so it's just convenient when as we switch into new years to sort of take that time and say, okay, going to kind of forget the past, and sometimes that's wonderful to do, especially if it feels like it was kind of a challenging year, good riddance 2014, and some of the challenges we faced, and uh, it's good to look forward with hope. How many know that God has a, has a future for you, and it's a good future, and he has good plans, and one of the, part of the, uh, what the Bible calls the perseverance of the saints is the ability, because of our faith and our trust in God, to always look to the future with incredible hope, believing with all our heart that it holds good things and that God is up to something good. And that if we follow him faithfully, we get to just be part of the goodness of who he is and what he's doing. And so I face every year, and we just kind of come into it, and we pray about it, kind of what's up for the next year, Lord? Is there anything you want us to focus on? And, and as I do that, you know, I'm always really kind of thinking, as I'm asking the Lord, you know, is there, is there a particular thing you would speak to us in this next year or have us focus on or direction you kind of have us go in? And, and I'm always kind of really, well, I have my radar up for and my eyes to look for is what is God doing? You know, Jesus was very clear that he only did what he saw the Father doing. And sometimes, you know, we think that um, we're always having to hear from God about what to do, when in reality, a lot of times, we just need to see what he's doing, and there's your answer. You know, we don't need a word from the Lord. All we need to do is look at what he's doing. I guarantee you, if you jump in with what God's doing, it's a good place to be. You're not going to miss it. You're going to be in his will. It's the best word you'll ever get is just look at what he's doing and jump right in with it. And so it's good to hear, but I always kind of like to look as well. So as we look, I, I, was, I was looking. It was like, what is God up to? And I just felt like there were really two areas that I, 
I just could really see the anointing of God and the presence of God and the pleasure of God and just him working in. And it was this. One would be the harvest. I'm just telling you, and I know we live in New England, and for Christians who have been in New England for any period of time, you know, we have all kinds of things we like to talk about in New England in terms of its unfriendliness towards the gospel. And uh, I'm just telling you, you know, I don't care about all that. I just know that God's moving in people's hearts in this hour. And there's just a, there's a wide openness. There is, you know, it's, it's, it's like I think, I know there's a lot of anti-Christ stuff in, in our culture and whatnot, but at the same time, there is such a deep hunger. Will the real God stand up? Will the real Jesus stand up? And sometimes some, some of the negativity towards Christianity is truly the antichrist, what the Bible calls the antichrist spirit. There is a spirit at work in the world that is adamantly opposed to Jesus and his work. But there's also sometimes some of the negativity is because there's just a misunderstanding of who God is. And there's a, there's a reaction to a false picture and sometimes we're guilty of giving a false picture really of Christianity and who Christ is and then the culture reacts against that and then we get mad at the culture for reacting against a negative picture of who he really is that's somewhat our own fault and uh, so you know say all that there's there there is while there is a lot of anti stuff there is a deep hunger to know God a deep hunger to want to know what God is up to the real Jesus and when he gets presented there's, there's a response, a wonderful response to say, yes, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of what he's doing. And there's a, there's a harvest happening. It's happening right in our midst. It's ready. Jesus didn't have to give a word about the harvest. He just told his disciples, just lift up your heads and look. And if you lift up your heads and look and then maybe don't get so focused on your own feet and your own navel, belly button, but actually look at what is happening, you will see that God is moving on the hearts of people. And he said, pray for the laborers. We don't need to pray for the harvest. We need to pray for the laborers to go into the harvest. The second area I really see God working in and moving and there's an anointing and he's, and he's really into it is when the body comes together and loves one another. And there's all kinds of moves of God, even here in our own state and, and uh, in New England, for the body to come together in unity. And it's happening in prayer. It's happening in worship. It's happening in other stuff. Um, and that's, that's awesome. That's certainly an expression of that. God's doing it kind of body-wide, but he does it when two or three gather, when we gather together, when we come together to love one another. And I know there's a lot of disillusionment with the church uh, sometimes in culture and a lot of times even within Christianity itself, I totally get it, but I also know this. I know with a passion, I know with absolute certainty, Jesus loves his church. Okay, listen, when you look at, you look at what, you know, all of history, whether, whether you can see it or not, and I hope you can, I hope you have eyes to see it. All of history, God is moving all of history to a grand conclusion. The project that he started, he's bringing to a completion. He's doing it through Jesus. He's gonna make all that is wrong right. His kingdom is coming, ready or not, wanted or not, it's happening. Jesus is the king, it's going on. And when Jesus, in, a, in the vision he gives to the apostle John, when he brings it to all the conclusion, the picture is one of a wedding between Jesus and the bride. Jesus said, I will build my church. I tell you, he is absolutely passionately in love with the church, meaning the people, not the buildings and institution, but the people of God. He's totally in love with that. He's totally, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And the joy set before him was a people set aside for him, to him, And he's excited. He's excited for that last day. He said, you will, I will not you know, drink or, or eat again until I do it basically with my bride at the completion of all things. He's excited for that time. He's excited about his bride. He's excited about the church, the people of God. He's excited about community. And when the body of Christ comes together to love one another, I'm telling you, he's, he's in it. You know, it's interesting. Jesus 
talked about his presence would be with us. He'd never forsake us. He'll always be with us. And he really emphasized that in two contexts. One was gathering together and two was going. He said, when two or three gather in my name, there I am in their midst. And he said, now go, therefore, into all the nations, making disciples of all people groups, and lo, I will be with you to the end. He's really into gathering, and he's really into going. And that's the things I'm really seeing God do. And so, you know, we're kind of, I've seen this kind of praying, Lord, you know, what would you have us do? And, and uh, you know, one of the things, you know, I always ask as I'm asking the Lord about these things is, okay, what about, you know, how can we be more effective? How can, I be, how can we be more effective as, as a church? And, you know, we have a, we have a simple mission. It's the mission that pretty much every church has. They all kind of, we all kind of say it differently and express it differently, but it's basically the mission that Jesus gave his church. Our mission is very, is very simple. It's to love God. It's to love people. It's to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and it's to help equip the body to fulfill God's purposes. Our vision, what we'd like to see is we want to see every person, every individual, every community of believers and the culture at large transformed through an authentic relationship and a personal relationship and an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And we basically here at Life, we have three core values that we just kind of focus on that we think helps us kind of in this mission. And it's basically this. We call it connect, serve, grow. The other way of saying it is we want to do life together. There's something about living out life together and building relationships that is just key. You can't do kingdom. You can't do Jesus, so to speak. You can't follow him. You can't be with him apart from community and relationships. Second is that we want to learn and grow together. And I appreciate that you all like to listen to me at times. Maybe some of you do. (laughs) And I appreciate that, but honestly, learning and growing, and while I, I believe in preaching with all my heart, I'm called to be a preacher, and I do it with passion. I love doing it, and I believe it's vital and critical, but some of the most powerful learning and growing that we do has to be done in the context of, of, of corporateness, not just corporately listening to a preacher, but corporately learning and, and doing together. Every person has something to bring. Every person has something to teach. Every person has something to learn. And sometimes, you know, we don't value coming together in in community oftentimes because we don't value what we have to bring. And sometimes I, you know, we uh, honestly, you know, and take it however you want to, but, but sometimes we get, we get focused on, on gatherings and meetings and the things that we do together. We get focused on what's in it for me. And we tend to evaluate what we participate in based on what we think is the benefit to us. And I'm not saying that's wrong in the sense that by all means, there's lots of benefits that flow. <laughs> That's wonderful, and, and obviously, you know, I do encourage every, every believer to be part of a community, and you certainly want to be part of a community where you're growing and, and receiving, but, but the, first, the first thing we should think about is what do I have to bring? And I'm just telling you, we so often, I so often, you so often underestimate the value that you bring. And sometimes we get focused on the gifts that we have as if the gifts that we have represent the value that we bring and we forget that who we are is the greatest value that we bring. And who Jesus is in us. You would be amazed, I'm, I'm amazed at how often I underestimate and how often I see other people esti- underestimate the value of their presence. Just being part of something. If you have a party, don't you really appreciate it when the people you invite actually come? Do you, I mean, you know, and you may have a party and you may say, hey, you know, hey, 
bring a snack, bring an appetizer, but do you really care what they bring? What is it that you really value when you have a party? Them. I'm just happy that you came because you're the party. And sometimes we think like, you know, and we have gatherings, obviously we have a corporate gathering on Sunday morning and there's other gatherings. Sometimes we, you know, we're, we just so underestimate the value of us just being there. Oh, nobody will notice if I'm not there. I don't have much to give. Baloney. <laughs> Who's telling you that? Right. It's not Jesus. <laughs> it's not his Holy Spirit. I'm pretty sure, I'm, I mean, I'm not perfect, but I'm pretty sure I've never told anybody that. Jesus talked about, he used parables like that about, he, he, you know how many party prince, uh, parables Jesus told? He told lots of party parables. Jesus painted this picture of the kingdom like it's a party. <laughs> and the only ones who aren't going to be part of the party are the party poopers. That's really the picture. The, it, is a, it is, you know, I'm a universalist in this sense, and don't stone me, okay? Listen to me. For, <laughs> it's a universal invitation. Yes, he desires that none would perish, but that all would be saved. It is a universal invitation. Everybody, and if you look at the parables, I mean, some of the parables Jesus talked about, it was, it was like, really, everybody's included, but some people, because of their attitude and their party poopiness, basically <laughs> get themselves, they just, they, just, they just grumpy themselves right out of the party. It's like they're, it's, it's almost like the picture, we tend to think sometimes, I don't, you know, maybe I'm going to mess with some theology right now, but sometimes we tend to think of the picture like, like, like you're out, and you have to get yourself in. But some of the parables that Jesus told, I'm just, read them. Some of the parables that Jesus told were more like you're in unless you get yourself out. It's like Jesus died for everybody. Everybody is included, but if you want to be a party pooper, if you don't want to be part of the kingdom, if you don't like what Jesus is all about, you can just grumpy and unbelieve yourself right out. The picture is that persistent unbelief, you do it to your own destruction. Jesus did everything necessary to save you. You're part of the party unless by your own obstinance and unbelief, you refuse to be part of the party. <laughs> or if you try to get into the party but on the wrong reason. He said, the only way you're going to be part of this party, it is a grace party. You got to have the right clothes, and the only clothes that are going to be the right ones are the one that Jesus himself gives you. You're not going to go in based on your own sense of worth, your own sense of performance, like somehow you've earned it. That whole idea that if I can just do enough good to outweigh the bad that I did, pfft, doesn't work. That's just silliness and foolishness and stupid thinking. As if you could do enough good to outweigh the bad. All right. That wasn't what I meant to go to, to this morning, but that was, that was good. <laughs> okay, so let me get uh, back on track. So, um, so these two areas. So anyways, so we're, I just were to kind of ask the Lord, like, you know, what, what would you have us focus on? And, and uh, I really just felt like the Lord just wanted to get back to, to simplicity. And I was reminded of, uh, I think it was Paul, when he talked to one of the churches, and he said, I'm just jealous for you 
that you would just get a hold of and get back to the simplicity of devotion to Jesus. The simplicity of devotion to Jesus. You know, and I was asking the Lord about, okay, how can we be more effective? Where are some of the areas that would just seem to be a little bit weak as a church? And there's, you're doing such amazing things. You're doing amazing things in the context of harvest, you're doing amazing things in the context of coming together to love one another. And, you know, where we felt we were just a little bit weak in is one, we've seen a lot of people um, come to faith, uh, especially over the last year or two, um, and maybe even more so. And we've struggled really with, I think, being super effective at helping them get off to an awesome start in their, in, their, in their walk with Jesus and really helping to disciple new believers. The other area we feel like we were a little bit weak in is really being able to properly shepherd everybody. You know, and we have a, I get a lot of feedback from guests and visitors that, you know, we're a very welcoming and friendly church. Uh, but I also hear um, from a lot of people who just feel a little bit on the outside and feel like sometimes really being able to connect in is a little bit harder. And so as we were kind of praying about this, I really felt like what we needed, what the Lord wanted us to do was simplicity of, of devotion to Jesus. And what we needed to focus on was the simplicity of just following Jesus and helping others to follow Jesus. Basically, discipleship. Focus just on discipling. And so that's really where we feel the focus to be for this year um, is, is just on that, discipling especially helping to disciple new believers, but helping to disciple all of us. That all of us would understand and have a, have a desire, I hope, to really want to follow Jesus. One, two, three, four, five, okay. <laughs> it's the invitation that he makes. As I said, he's the king. He's not, up, he's, he's not campaigning for kingship. He's already been ascended. He's already been appointed. He's already been chosen the Messiah. He's the king. He's already began God's new creation. God's new world is already in effect. All right? And uh, the way in, so to speak, is just to simply believe, trust, and follow Jesus. And so we felt this year there'd be a year we're just going to focus on that. We're going to focus on following Jesus. But part of following Jesus, I believe, is to help others follow Jesus. It's, it's challenging to be a follower of Jesus and not also want to help others to follow Jesus. Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give. And it's a theme throughout his life and throughout his teaching and everything he did, he freely gave and what he gave to the ones he gave, he really encouraged them to now take what he had done in their lives, what they had received from God, what they had experienced by God, the incredible grace and mercy and the incredible impact that God had now had in their life, they were to now give that away and to do, the, do for others and to care for others as they have received and been cared for by Jesus himself. And so we've actually started a couple of new things. One is we've actually started uh, what, something we called new, believing, new Believer Coaching. And so anybody who is kind of a new believer, fresh in their faith, new in their faith, maybe you've been a believer for a while but never been coached, and we've actually had people, and if you want to be one of those, come talk to Pastor Mike. Um, but we have people who have said and volunteered to say, you know what, I would like to be able to just pour into a new believer and help them get off to a good start. Something I'm particularly passionate about, I can remember when I was a brand new believer, I was, you know, I was a young man, I was in my mid to late 20s actually, and um, kind of new to this whole thing, and there was an older man who actually took the time to meet with me every single week. And it started off actually as a men's group, and there was like four or five or six guys that got together on a Saturday morning just to pray and fellowship and study the Bible, and and for different reasons, they, uh, the guys kept had to kind of drop out. And I ended up with just the two of us. It was me and this older gentleman. And he said, if you want, I will keep coming every single Saturday for as long as you want in order to pour into you. And I was so hungry, I was like, absolutely. And I got up early every Saturday morning and went to meet with this gentleman. And he just took the time, answered any questions I had, you know, help me to learn how to study the Bible and learn the Bible and just, you know, he was so full of faith and so full of joy. He was so happy all the time. 
I never once saw this guy ever get upset or not be happy. It was like, just help me get there. And he took the time to do that. And uh, I cannot, I could not thank him enough. And it lasted for maybe four or five months, six months maybe. We we were friends for a long time after that. But that six-month investment completely changed my life. And I'm absolutely who I am today because of the investment that that man made in my life. You know, and I'm sure he had absolutely no idea what the long-term effect of his time investment would be other than he knew that he just had a love for me because I was a brand new believer. So we started kind of this, this uh, new believer coaching. And so if you're in that place, and you said, even if you've been in your faith longer but felt like maybe you haven't grown a lot and have never had a mentor, we have a program now to be able to help you someone who will come alongside you and encourage you and help you get off to a great start as you walk in Jesus. And if you want to be one of those, come talk to Pastor Mike because he's going to be actually kind of running that program. The other area, it's been something we've done for a while, but we really feel a renewed um, sense of vigor, if you will, to be able to do this as life groups. There's something about meeting together relationally in smaller groups that is key, absolutely key, and it's Big celebrations like this are awesome, um, but there's nothing that takes the place, I believe, of meeting together in smaller groups in the home. There is something so powerful and dynamic about that. That's where real relationships happen. That's where the body really comes together. Um, It's where a lot of mission takes place, if you will. So much happens in these smaller gatherings. It's key. So... We're actually going to have a a whole new set, if you will, of life groups that will be starting. And we actually have a launch Sunday in March that you're all invited to on March 8th where we'll have all the life group leaders here, some of the new ones. And if you're interested in at at some point starting one, again, come talk to us. Come talk to Kevin. And uh, I I really believe it will be a powerful thing. I'll talk more about it as we go on. And I really hope everyone will consider, you know, finding a way to be able to plug into a smaller group, it will, it will, not only will you grow, but again, remember, you have something to give. And one of the best ways to help to give away what you've been given is to be in relationship with people that you can do that with. <clears throat> I also believe that life groups are one of the best ways to reach into our community. And I can't tell you how many people I've known who have come into, you know, they wouldn't necessarily go to a church Sometimes it's just because of preconceived notions of what church is like, but in a home, and all of a sudden you build friendships, you build relationships. It's amazing what happens. All right, so I've said enough, and hopefully this month I'll be able to share more along those lines. All right, I've used up way too much time. I want to take a quick look at one of the stories in the Bible, and I hope this story uh, is your story or will be your story soon. And I want to take a look at a man who accepted the invitation to follow Jesus. And he did follow him for three and a half years, spent time with him, and then failed Jesus miserably. Only to be lovingly and wonderfully restored. You may know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Apostle Peter. Peter's story is an amazing story. And um, Peter was actually referred to by Paul, one of the greatest apostles. Paul called Peter a pillar in the church. You may remember that after Pentecost, Peter stood up and preached. And 3,000 people were saved in one preach. You may remember that Peter um, was the one who boldly healed a man with those now famous words, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus. That's pretty cool. Peter was actually the first to go to the Gentiles with the gospel after having a vision. I remember that Peter, at one point, would walk down the street and his shadow would heal people. If they knew the route that Peter was going to take, people would bring the sick out into the street that his shadow would heal them. 
Peter suffered relentless persecution. Tradition says he actually went to Babylon in modern-day Iraq, preached boldly there. He eventually took his entire family. Peter was married and had a family. Took his entire family to Rome and encouraged the church there. He was put in prison for nine months, tortured, finally being crucified, and he said, I do not want to, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus was crucified. So the Romans said, fine. And they turned him upside down and crucified him upside down. Now I'm sure Peter in his early young days, in his absolute wildest dreams, never remotely imagined the kind of life he would live and the things that Jesus would do through him. All right, Peter was a fisherman. That's interesting. Jesus actually began his public ministry up near the Sea of Galilee, which is actually where Peter lived. And Jesus is healing the sick, and he's casting out demons, and he's drawing quite a crowd. And there was one uh, day where he's actually on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd is gathering and gathering so much to the effect that he's not much room, so Jesus actually turns and there's a man by the name of Peter next to him who has a boat. And he gets in Peter's boat and says, push me out and let me speak to the crowd. And so he does that. When he's finished, he turns to Peter and Peter's fishing buddies who have been fishing all night and have caught nothing. And he says, now go out and try again. And they go out. And sure enough, they pull in so much fish that the boats begin to sink. And we're told that Peter, when he sees this incredible miracle happen, he falls down at the feet of Jesus and says this, get away from me, for I'm a sinner. And Jesus responds to Peter with these wonderful words. He says to Peter, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. Very, very powerful. And of course, Peter has all kinds of memorable moments with Jesus. You may remember the time that he walked on water. That's a pretty cool thing. That's a little bit memorable. <laughs> Literally walks on water. When a lot of the other disciples of Jesus began leaving him because they thought that the message that Jesus was preaching wasn't exactly what they were looking for in the Messiah. As a matter of fact, it was pretty hard. So they began to leave. Peter is the one who says, where shall we go? You have the words of life. And then when others viewed Jesus as a prophet, Peter is the one who said, you are the Christ. And Jesus commends him and says, You didn't come up with that, but that was actually revelation from God the Father. It's pretty cool when Jesus tells you, you got a revelation from God. (laughs) That's a good revelation. You're in a good place when Jesus can say, yeah, that came from God. Okay, it's good if somebody else confirms it, but it's really good if Jesus confirms it. But it's interesting, the story that was told about Peter in all of the Gospels and the one that Peter himself made sure was told was the story of his greatest failure. And uh, the reason why Peter made sure that it was told was because his failure, and more importantly, Jesus' response to his failure is one of the greatest stories of redemption that has inspired generations of believers for thousands of years. It was so powerful that John, a friend and a partner of Peter, ends his very powerful gospel with Peter's restoration. So, that's real quick. If we turn to Mark chapter 14, I'm going to have to speed it up real fast. So just hold on to your seats you're drinking like a fire hydrant right now. All right. So it's the uh, night before Jesus is crucified. They're at the Last Supper, and Jesus says, um, 
talking to his disciples, he says, um, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, I love this, Peter, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so Peter is absolutely adamant he's going to be the exception. Jesus said, listen, you're all going to get scattered because of what's going to happen, but basically don't worry after you get scattered, I'm going to Galilee. Meet me there, basically. But Peter's like, oh, no, 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 no. The other clowns, yeah, they might be scattered, but this is Peter you're talking to, Jesus. I'm ready to die for you. And of course, in the garden, when the crowds came at Jesus, Peter's like, here's my chance. Pulls out his sword. Like I said, whew. Very bold. <clears throat> Fast forward, not very fast. Far fast forward a few hours, as a matter of fact, a little bit later. And we read this. As Peter was below in the courtyard, so Jesus is now, he's before his accusers and, and uh, before the high priest and the Sanhedrin and stuff like that, and he's, you know, they're putting the crowns on his head and doing all kinds of abusive things to him. It says, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter uh, warming himself, she took she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. And he went out onto the porch and a rooster crowed. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean also. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man who you are talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed in the second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before a rooster crows tri- twice, you will deny me three times, and he began to weep. Um, in one of the other stories, we find out that at this third denial is when Jesus looked at Peter. In other words, Peter was close enough, he could actually see Jesus. And then the third denial, when it says that Peter was cursing and swearing, and the only time we hear that is actually in Mark, which is, which was the, probably the gospel that Peter had the influence on, because Mark was a disciple of Peter, is it, we, we find out here that, that, that in his third denial, he's so adamant he's cursing and swearing. Now, that does not mean foul language. I'm not talking about cussing. Cursing and swearing in the Bible times refer to the kind of thing where it, in order to sort of try to prove you were saying something right, you would call a curse upon yourself if you were lying. Okay? So like you might see, like you see sometimes where people would say, you know, may this be done to me or worse if I don't do this. Okay? It was a way of you're, you're swearing you'll do something and you're calling a curse upon yourself if you do not fulfill that which you swore to do. That's what cursing and swearing means. It's not, a, it's not a foul language, a cussing thing. It means to call a curse upon yourself, okay, or to call a curse upon another person. So here, Peter, is, he's not just denying he knows Jesus. He's doing it by either calling curses upon himself or maybe even upon Jesus to prove he doesn't know Jesus. He's being really intense here. He's passionately denying that he even knows Jesus, calling curses upon himself or even upon Jesus himself. And at that point, his most adamant denial with cursing and swearing is when Jesus sees him and hears him do this. And so at the, arguably the point at which Jesus needed his friends the most was the very point where Peter, who was one of the three closest disciples, right in the hearing and sight of Jesus, passionately denies even knowing him with cursing upon himself or upon Jesus. So you get a sense of why Peter, when all of a sudden this hits him, and he's reminded that Jesus himself warned him it says that he was bitterly weeping and he ran out. 
Okay, that's the bad news. Maybe you feel like you've had moments where you have utterly failed Jesus. Well, let's go now to John chapter 21. And this is after the resurrection. Jesus is now going to meet with his disciples again. They're back on the Sea of Galilee. He's with his disciples. Um, he's, like he's on the shore again. They've been fishing all night. And uh, Jesus is on the beach, and he calls out to them, and he says, cast your net on the other side. And they're like, <laughs> come on, we've been doing this all night. And again, they do it. They catch so many fish. The boat's getting ready to capsize. All of a sudden, they recognize this is Jesus. And Peter jumps out of the boat and runs to the shore. Okay, and then when he runs to the shore, Jesus basically takes Peter aside very personally. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. It's an, inc an incredible, amazing, beautiful picture of Jesus restoring Jesus, uh, Peter. Now, obviously, Jesus asked him this question, do you love me? He asked him three times. Now, it's very clear what Jesus is doing because Peter had denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus, in restoring Peter, is asking him this question three times. And it's interesting the way in which he does it. The first time that Jesus asked this question, and it should be just as a side note, John is summarizing a, a conversation and dialogue that's happening. So this conversation and dialogue is much longer, but John is giving us the condensed version. So the first time that Jesus asked this question of Peter, he asked it this way. Do you love me more than these? Because if you recall, when Peter boldly proclaimed his loyalty to Jesus, he made the proclamation, I'm more loyal than everyone else. And so Jesus is now saying, okay, do you love me more than these? And Peter, of course, at this point is very humbled. And he doesn't um, make any in his response, Lord, you know that you know all things. You know that I love you. He doesn't say, you know that I love you more than anybody else. He's humbled at this point, and he's, But he does affirm his love for Jesus. The second time, he asked, do you love me? Peter again answers with what I believe is a very authentic affirmation of his love for Jesus. Now, how many have heard teaching on this particular um, passage and you've heard that, uh, that, that there's two forms, there's two words for love that are used in this particular passage? One's agape love and one's uh, phileo. It's two different words for love in Greek, agape and, and, uh, and, and phileo. And when the first two times that Jesus asked the question, he asked, using the word agape, do you agape me? And the first two times that Peter answers, he answers with, you know that I phileo you. He uses a different word for love, okay? And, a lot, and I just want to give you a little bit different perspective than probably what a lot of people heard because most people hear this teaching and they hear it in this context. Jesus is asking, do you agape me? Agape being the highest form of love that represents the love that God has. And Peter answers with phileo, which um, is more like a brotherly love. Okay, where we get the word Philadelphia from, Philadelphia, brotherly love, it's a city of brotherly love. Um, and so the, the, the idea being that Jesus is asking, do you love me with this God kind of love? And Peter's saying, well, no, I'm not quite there. I'm only at friendly love. And eventually Jesus comes down to his thing. And I, I think that misses the point, um, really, of, of what's going on here. I want to give a little bit different perspective real quick. First of all, Peter and, and, um, and, and John, uh, Jesus and Peter, I mean, didn't have this conversation in Greek. John writes it in Greek. They had a conversation in Aramaic. 
probably didn't have different words for love, okay? But there's a reason why John emphasizes two different ones. And the difference, the, the difference between agape and phileo is not so much agape is here and phileo is here. Agape is the more generic, widely, all-encompassing word for love, okay? It is unconditional, um, um, but it's, it's the more widely used, over-encompassing word for love. Phileo is not an inferior love to agape. Phileo just emphasizes a little bit something different. Phileo um, emphasizes the affectionate part that goes with love. So in other words, <clears throat> we have love for everybody. But when you have somebody who's exceptionally close to you, it's not so much that you necessarily love them more, but you have an affection that goes with that love that is much more intense than you do maybe for someone else. So you love a brother. The reason why you call it brotherly love is because there's an affection that goes with it because they're a brother or a sister or a family member. Okay, so even though you, know, you can have love for everybody, and we're called to love everybody, when you get to know somebody, there's a sense in which there's an aspect of your, of, of, there's, a, there's an emotional, affectionate um, aspect of love that, be, that you begin to experience with them because of your closeness to them and your intimacy with them. Does that make sense? It's not a superior love. It just means phileo is just emphasizing the um, affection that accompanies when you intimately get to know somebody. Does that make sense? Whereas the agape is referring to the all-encompassing, unconditional love. So Jesus is just, so, so John, when he records this conversation, when Jesus asks the first two times, he's just, he, he, he's just emphasizing the, the, the general over, overriding term for love. Peter is, is the one who is emphasizing the passionate part that he feels for Jesus. So it's not that Peter is coming, is saying, you know what, I've only got like a lesser kind of love for you. What he's doing is he's passionately saying, you know that I have affection. I love you, Lord, as a, as a brother. It's like friend. I have this intimate love for you is what he's saying. And it's interesting. Peter is saying this. He's saying, you know. Now, this it, it's is it's it's an important thing because when Peter had denied Jesus. Peter thought he knew some things that Jesus didn't. Jesus said, you're going to fall away. Peter said, no, I'm not. Okay, after that whole failure, Peter has a new perspective. Jesus might know some things I don't know. <laughs> And it's probably not a good idea to claim something to be true if it's not true. <clears throat> and so for Peter to say, you know that I love you is a very authentic expression of love. How could you possibly tell the one who knows all things if you don't actually believe what you're saying to be true and that he could confirm it? So Peter is saying, Lord, you know, you know, you know that I love you with this intimate love. And Jesus doesn't say, no, you don't. He says, now feed my sheep. And so then he asks him again, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know, you know that I have this affection for you, this love for you. Then the third time, Jesus now says, do you phileo? He comes to use the same word, Peter. What he's emphasizing is Peter. Do you really, do you really have this affectionate love for me? That's the sense of it. Do you really have this affectionate love for me? And just as when Peter denied Jesus the third time, with the, it, was, it was his most intense denial, and the one where Jesus himself sees and hears this, I suspect that on this third one, as Jesus says, do you really have this affectionate love for me? He's looking right at Peter in the eyes again. And this time, Peter says he's grieved. Why is he grieved? I suspect he gets what Jesus is doing. All of a sudden, it clicks. 
I denied him three times, and now he's asked me three times. And the grief is probably coming out of remembering his denial of Jesus. But now <coughs> he gives his most intense affirmation of love for Jesus. He says, Lord, you know all things. I get it. <laughs> yeah, no more claiming stuff. <laughs> that isn't true. <laughs> you know all things. You know that I have this passionate affection and love for you. And so just as his third denial was as most intense as Jesus is watching, his third affirmation of his love for Jesus is his most intense, right in the presence of Jesus. It's an amazing picture of restoration. And of course, Jesus responds. Each time he says, do you love me? And Peter affirms his love, which by the way, you know, that is, part of, that is part of your restoration. That is part of your redemption. When Jesus himself can draw out of you love for him, that's redemption. That is restoration. See, the problem is we don't love. The problem is a broken relationship with the Lord. That's the problem. All sin, all dysfunction, everything we see going wrong in the world is ultimately a result of the lack of faith and trust that we have in God and the lack of love that we have. Every problem in the world is, is, a, is a problem of lack of love, really, at its kind of core. And so the restoration and the redemption of, of, of all of us is when love for God is restored. You know, sometimes we just think about, you know, God's salvation as God's, you know, forgiveness of our sins. Which obviously, that's been done. But salvation and restoration isn't just about forgiveness of sin. It's about the restoration of relationship to God. And the surest and the surest sign of the work of the Holy Spirit, the surest sign of the presence of Jesus in your life is the restoration of love in your heart. First towards God and then towards one another. And so when Jesus says, do you love me? You know, <clears throat> he's not trying to tell Peter, Peter, I love you. He's asking Peter, do you love me? Now, of course, we love because he first loves. And obviously, we want to preach the message that God is love and he loves you. It's the kindness of God that causes us to repent and turn around and change our lives and come back to him. Uh, but, but, the, but what really needs to happen beyond just us knowing that God loves us is for us to know that we love him and for it to be real and genuine. And when, the, when authentic love arises and is formed in your heart, first towards God and then towards one another, salvation has come. Redemption has come to you. The kingdom has come to you. Jesus has come to you. The Holy Spirit is at work in you. And so now when, when he asks this question, he doesn't have to tell Peter how much he loves Peter. He's living out his love for Peter. He's living it right out. Peter doesn't have to wonder. In the moment of his greatest failure, Jesus is loving him and coming to him, taking him aside. Now remember, when, when, Jesus, when some of the others saw Jesus, Jesus said, go tell the others and specifically make sure you go get Peter. He's just living out his love for Peter. What he's trying to draw to Peter is Peter's love. And then when Peter affirms his love, Jesus now says, now feed my sheep. And that's very, very profound, okay? Jesus really, if you look at it, what he's doing is he's focusing on the two greatest commandments. 
Because if you remember, all of Jesus' teaching was summed up, he said, in the commands to love. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. God is love. All of his teachings, you know, life is in the love of God. Restoration is the restoration of God's life and his love. And so Jesus basically is focusing on these two greatest commandments. Do you love me? He's drawing out of Peter love for himself, love for Jesus, love for Peter's love for Jesus. And now he's saying, care for my sheep, tend for my sheep, love my people basically. One of the things that is so key to understand, and there's a reason why Jesus links these things in together. Peter, do you love me? Now, care for my sheep, tend for my lambs, care for my people, love the people that I've died for. <laughs> love others. The reason why it's so connected, we have to understand, is that the same faculty in us that loves God is the same faculty in us that loves others. And that's why John makes the statement <coughs> that if you claim to love God, but you don't love your brother, you're a liar. Why? It's the same faculty. You can't love God and not love people. It's the same lover in you, so to speak. Does that make sense? You know, it's sort of like um, the same uh, dynamic takes place with forgiveness. Jesus said, if you forgive, God will forgive you. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. Now we look at that, we think that's a threat. Like if you're not going to forgive, listen, Jesus told you to forgive, and if you don't forgive, God's not forgiving you. There. <laughs> you hellbound sinner. And that's not Jesus' point at all. His point is this, the same faculty in you that forgives is the same faculty in you that receives forgiveness. It is absolutely impossible to hold unforgiveness towards another person and at the same time receive forgiveness for yourself. Can't be done. It's the same faculty in you that does both. If one is blocked, the other by definition is, it's the same thing. And the Bible is very clear, you're all victims, and you're all perpetrators. I'm a victim, and I'm a perpetrator. Again, love being formed in our heart it really is the ultimate sign of God's redemptive work. I like how the, uh, John puts it in one of his epistles. He says, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Okay, and basically what, what, what John is getting at is the true sign of the redemptive work of God at work in us is when love gets formed in our heart so that we begin to love and live and walk the same way that Jesus walked and lived because he's in us. Christ said all ministry is geared towards this, that Christ would be formed in us. What does that mean to have Christ formed in us? It means that very thing, that, that the very love of Christ, the very nature of Christ, the very character, the same motivations that he has are being formed in our heart. They become ours. And so as our love for God gets affirmed, it's got to go out <laughs> towards others. One of the other uh, principles, and I'll wrap up here real quick. Um, the path to greatness in the kingdom of God is love and humility. Love and humility. It was clear in Jesus' teaching, Proverbs says, before his downfall a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. When Peter was proud, he failed. But now that Peter was humbled 
and began to focus on love, guess what Jesus now says to him? After these, this interaction with this, do you love me, feed my sheep thing, then Jesus tells Peter basically that Peter is indeed going to be courageous. He's going to be so courageous and he's going to be so full of love that he's going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and lay down his life for the sheep. That's what Jesus did, literally lay down his life all the way to the cross. And he, P, uh, Jesus tells Peter the same thing. You will lay down your life in love for the sheep all the way to your own crucifixion. And Peter's crucifixion was just the same, same sign, if you will, that he had laid down his life for the sheep. When he was proud, he failed. When he was humbled and focused on love, Jesus said, you will succeed. It's powerful. And so I'll just leave you with this thought. You know, sometimes, um, you know, the good news is very clear, very clear in its condemnation of sin, all right? And because of that, sometimes we fall into the trap where we want to focus on not sinning. The good news, of course, is that we've been set free from the bondage of sin. But we can fall into the trap of thinking that in order to walk in that freedom, we must manage our sin and be constantly diligent to avoid any of it. I say it's a trap because if you look at the teachings of Jesus, he was more focused on what we should do than on what we should not do. Jesus said that to be a disciple or a follower of him, and his last words to Peter were the same as his first words to Peter. His first words to Peter when he met him on the sea that day fishing was, come follow me. The very last words after he had this interaction with, with Peter, after he told Peter he would indeed be courageous, <clears throat> he then says, now Peter, follow me. And the last lesson he had to learn was, Peter turns around and says, well, there's John. What about John? What's in store for him? All right, which is so a problem for all of us. Come on. Is there anybody here who doesn't struggle with comparing yourself to somebody else? All right, we're so worried about, well, what about this person? Why this? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing this? Why is God doing this in their life? Why is God leading them there? Why do they have this? Whatever. And, 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 and Jesus just turns to Peter and says, Peter, don't look at John. Look at me. Don't worry about what I have in store for him. You follow me. Okay? But in following Jesus, he says, he just says, listen, to follow me, just keep what's on my heart, on your heart, what my teachings are. And his teachings basically are, again, summarized in love God and love your neighbor. And I think if we would focus instead of just trying to focus on what we shouldn't do, if we focused on what we should do, which is love, yes. Paul makes this astounding statement. He makes several astounding statements about love. The first thing he says is that there's no law against it. I mean, sometimes we're so worried about what we shouldn't do, like, can I do this, can I do that, you know? How about we just focus on what we should you can't go wrong. Jesus, Paul said, there is no law. There's never a point where it's like, you shouldn't have loved. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we get so wrapped up, like what is God's will? How do I align my life with God's will? That we just miss the obvious stuff. I'll tell you what, dedicate your life. Every day get up and say, I am dedicated to love today. I am confident you just will not go wrong that day. 
Paul said, love never fails. You know, um, let me just use this last example. I know, I'll use the last example, kind of a picture. Anybody here ever um, tried to teach a, a child how to ride a bike? Right? And uh, one of the keys to riding a bike is balance, right? What's, th- what's the thing that always happens? Right? Boom, you fall to the left, you fall to the right, right? Now, listen, <coughs> if you want to teach someone to ride a bike and balance is the key and you don't want them to fall to the left or fall to the right, what happens if you focus solely on the balance? They'll fall. Imagine trying to teach a kid how to ride a bike by putting them on the bike and say, now, don't fall off it. Put your feet up on the pedals and don't fall. What's going to happen? Boom! I mean, to this day, I can't do that. Now, some people get really good. They can actually balance on a bike without it moving. I have cycled literally thousands of miles. I cannot balance a bike without it moving. How How do you teach a kid not to fall over? They have to do what? They got to move and have momentum. What happens with momentum? Momentum actually creates balance on a bike. Momentum creates balance. You don't have to focus on balancing. Focus on creating the momentum, and the momentum creates the balance. When it comes to following Jesus, listen, if we would focus on following him and focus on love... You can't love and sin at the same time. Can't be done. I'm going to pray. Stand and pray, yeah. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. I just thank you for this time that we've had this morning. It's always love to come together in your presence and your goodness is just astounding us continually. And we bless you for that and we thank you for that. Thank you for this day that you have given us, that we have breath to take and we have love to give. So, Father, I just pray this year as we continue to move forward, as you continue to move history forward toward your grand conclusion, Lord, I just pray you would continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit, continue to just give us grace in this ministry, Lord, that Christ would be formed in every single one of our hearts. Lord, I pray more than anything that love would flow both towards you and towards one another this year. And we know this will only happen by your grace. So thank you. Bless each person who's come here this morning. Strengthen them with your grace and your goodness. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for coming this morning.